John was enjoying a welcome mid-morning break when he was the victim of a vicious street crime. It cost him several thousand pounds, but it wasn't until the next day he realized the enormity of it. All he can recall is responding to a text from what he thought was his bank, urgently asking him to verify his security details. Moments later, he'd been robbed in broad daylight. You can't see cybercrime, but there are ways to avoid it. At Barclays, we'll never ask you to verify your security details by text. This is a global original podcast. Hello and welcome to Full Disclosure, a podcast project which you should know by now was conceived chiefly to allow me to spend a little bit more time talking to interesting people than is ordinarily available uh, in a radio studio. And, and well, to be honest, this week's guest, Peter Oborn, um, doyen of political journalists and, and, and one of the few commentators who I always found it difficult to predict what he would have to say on any given issue, isn't someone that I would struggle to spend a little bit more time with in normal circumstances because he only lives around the corner. Um, but 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 nonetheless, Peter, it's, it's lovely to have you here. And although I want to get a little quicker than usual to the present day with you, because your latest book about uh, the, the calumnies and the, the sort of corruption of fundamental truths evinced by the, the last American president and the current British Prime Minister is incredibly timely this week. We, we will begin at the beginning and, and perhaps with the question of when you first framed an ambition to become a journalist. Yes, it, it, in my case, it was very late indeed. I um, made a complete nonsense of my uh, early mid-20s. Uh, to, uh, I, uh, after university, I started a PhD, which I abandoned. And then I uh, went into the, in, rather despairing of all of that, I went into the city. I really was the most inappropriate merchant banker you can imagine. Um, <laughs> although I worked for N.M. Rothschild. And um, I tell you something which really annoys me when you read about city corruption. That's where I learned about integrity. I really learned from working for you know, the directors there, not that I ever got beyond the status of an incredibly bad bag carrier, about honesty in, in, in public life. You know, if, you do, if they put out an offer for sale document, you just went through every, you know, you couldn't put anything wrong about the asset statement or the profit and loss. It all had to be checked and rechecked. And of course, that was because you went to jail. If you, if you made lies, if you sold shares on the basis of a, a fraudulent or even a mistaken figure, you were, you were liable to go to jail. And actually, it was a very honest bank as well. So I um, really learned that there in a big way. And then, of course, when and, Tony Blair's dodgy dossier turned up, you know, when he produced a, uh, an offer for sale document for the Iraq war. And, you know, whereas, you know, the if N.O. Rothschild's offer for sale document it was fraudulent. It was only a bit of money which was stolen, but it never was because they never did it fraudulently. You know, there's a fraudulent offer for sale document which has led to tens of millions, you know, absolute chaos across the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's hit home hard to me, the difference between the moral calibre and standards of politicians and, uh, and being bankers, to be honest with you. Well, I mean, there's necessity attached to the banker's sort of regulation as opposed to as opposed to choice. But the, I guess comparing the end results is pertinent. You've already rushed ahead. We haven't. We still don't know why. You, I mean, apart from being crap at being a merchant banker, where, where did the idea that you might make a rather good journalist first yes. succeed? Well, actually, do you know, I, uh, I eventually again they were so nice, uh, and in Russia they didn't exactly sack <laughs> me, but it became very obvious that we were wasting each other's time. Um, but I really had a problem, actually, in my mid-twenties as to what to do, you know, new next. And uh, so I left the bank and I, uh, I thought, well, right, I'll have one. Actually, I would have become a school teacher, but I have a lot. I have a chat, 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 which I think I would have taught history rather nicely somewhere. And um, but I have a chuck at, at journalism. And uh, actually, this is quite shameful, James. I, I had a somebody I, I met, so bumped into somebody I'd been at school with a few years. and uh, he got me a, he introduced me to a mag, magazine owned by uh, Robert Maxwell called Financial Weekly. And I stopped 
And actually, I, I sold them an idea. I, I went up to the miners' strike. I bumped into a miner at Highbury and Islington Tube <laughs> collecting. And I was very Tory, of course. And so I said, yeah, absolutely outrageous. You should go back to work. He said, come and stay with me. So I did. I went and stayed with him for, uh, and his family and went on the picket line. And uh, he was a wonderful person. And his family were wonderful. And it was a very, and I, my first piece, I think my first piece of journalism, about a week, uh, obviously I had, it was projected as this merchant banker going to stay with a miners family and say what good people they were. I'm always surprised on, on this series, this full disclosure series, by the common experiences of quite disparate guests. So I don't know whether you know him, but so far, up until your mid to late 20s, you, you, your, your story is very similar to Monty Don's. The gardener. I mean, it's, he he also started a PhD and knocked it on the head during a sort of period of crisis. Tried a couple of other things before cracking on with the the career that that, that made him famous. But you mentioned your school days. His school days were very unhappy. Were yours? Did you? You were at Shelburne. Um, in yeah, so utter hell. Okay, utter. there we go again. I <laughs> uh, uh, total misery from start to finish. Yeah. I wish I, I, I very nearly sort of, I should have done too, you know, just left the school. But um, I think it was going for a bad patch. I went back to the school a couple of times to talk to careers classes and I thought that it was all much, much nicer and much more uh, agreeable. And the boys seemed to me to be much nicer than when I was there. Who, who, who were the problem, the teachers or the, or the pupils? The, the teachers, there were some wonderful teachers, although some of them were very yeah. grossy. But I, uh, the, I got uh, bullied a lot. And uh, actually, I, it was five years, of, four years, sorry, of utter hell. Really? Yeah. Uh, is that something you've thought about a lot or, or, or kind of no. worked through? Because on the positive side, I see it perhaps being a large part of this great sense of justice that you have, having had your formative years typified by injustice. i tell you what I realised. By the way, John McCurry went to the same school, and he left, yeah. and I'm sure he went through a similar experience. And um, no, I realised, but not at the time, but I, somebody explained to me there's a difference between being a good, a nice person and a charming person. I mean, people who are charming are not, People, sorry, popular. People who are popular and people who are good or nice. Mm. Popular does not mean that you're worth having as a friend at all. You're, you often means you're untrustworthy. And it, it took me a long. I was very unpopular at school, and it was, and it was, um, or oh, I felt I was, and, uh, and I realised afterwards that popularity often means sort of going with fashionable people and saying fashionable things. You know what I mean? I do. Yes, of course. And then because it's a boarding school, there's nowhere to hide. Absolutely not. No, you're sat in this, you know, this place, you're in dormitories that work with, you, know, you didn't have your own, nowhere, nowhere to get away from anybody. No day rooms, you know, you didn't have any personal space. But you got, I mean, you've got a decent enough education to get yourself into into Oxford to read history at Christ, uh, Cambridge, Cambridge sorry, to read yeah. history at Christ. Oh, yeah, the did you? It was a very good. Uh, there was a wonderful history teacher called Graham Stevenson who died a few years ago. And you know, we used he used to bring down, and this is it's, it's very. I've been reflecting on this. The political officer of the Soviet embassy would come down and give us talks. <laughs> And you know the idea now, which we and we, I'd sit there. It was amazing, brilliant stuff. You'd get the whole world from the point of view of the Soviet Union, and this is the height of the Cold War. And um, yeah. the idea, and the idea that that nowadays you'd get. Imagine the press uproar if the political officer, who I know very well, of the Iranian embassy. I mean, went to a school and gave you a talk about how Iran, Iran saw the world. They're very intelligent people, by the way. They really get it. I go to the Iranian embassy a great deal. I mean, they've, I've, I've, I've probably I'll get denounced for doing that. But actually, the, you've got to look at, you've got to understand other points of view. But and it really does strike me that one of the catastrophes, I think, of the last few years has been the complete narrowing of discourse. 
And mm. so you're only certain approved voices. And uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, embassy, the ambassador for the uh, Iranian embassy, I used to go, he's just gone, he's just left, but gone back to Tehran. Such an intelligent man, such a brilliant, brilliant take on the world. But of course, even to say that, is to, you get denounced for saying just that. That's the world we now yes. live in. Yes, I, we, we, it is. We, we're, he, we're heading towards the world we now live in. But let's just pause briefly in Cambridge. Did you find your tribe, which is a phrase that, that, that pops up often? No, um, I didn't. You no, didn't, I didn't find your tribe at Cambridge. Have you ever found no. your tribe? Well, no, not really. I haven't found it. Really. I feel a bit, lot more relaxed now, though. Rather <laughs> that I find, I, I find uh, the more you travel, the yes. more you realize there are so many different ways of living and difficult points of view. And you realize that people have a common humanity. Here we, you and I live in uh, Chiswick. You know, mm. therefore, that if you hire the local ta cabbie, he's going to be from Afghanistan or Iran, and he's, and he's probably arrived in this country in a container. Yes. And I've had so many com conversations with these people. And they're wonderful people, and their st their life stories are beyond belief. Yes. I mean, I, I met one taxi driver I was having a lot. He, he's just off. He works out of a firm just around the corner, and he arrived. You know, he and he, you know he 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 was a very successful accountant in uh, in Tehran, and but the firm he was auditing fell out somehow. They were doing something mildly dodgy with the authorities. And he realized, and, and, and his client got arrested, and he realized he had no future in Iran. He had to say, sold out everything. He just, he, he bought his way into London and, and did arrive on the proverbial container. Yeah. And he said to me, and his son is now, when he's going to get his son through, um, son is now a senior surgeon in London University. He said, my life is finished. My life is over. My son is now, he's, he's obviously a brilliant surgeon. And now that is, a, there are so many stories like that. Another story, there's another family of Afghans, very close by to us. They were a huge business in Afghanistan. It was a, they, they had big, big businessmen. And then after the uh, end of the, after the Russians went and the whole thing collapsed into the civil war, they, they, they realized that, and the Taliban were on the way. They flogged everything for nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars. They must have been a big, big firm. That was, yeah. And uh, and then they also there's forty seven of them, I think. And they um, they walk, they made their way to, first of all to Moscow. And then from Moscow, this is in nineteen, this is the mid nineteen nineties, Eastern Europe, and they arrived in London with people smugglers, who whipped the cop the, the, the fake passports off them as they arrived at Heathrow. And they had about $5,000 left. Good grief. And they, you, you'll know them, actually. I'm, I don't want to identify them, but you'll know who sure. I mean. But, and, and they're all now really successful businessmen. They're running lovely little businesses around here. And, that, and, and there are so many stories like that everywhere you go. With the new National Lottery Scratch Card, you could win a million pounds in an instant. Like when a pigeon does a number on your coat. Ugh. So you nip to the shop for tissues. And in that instant, you just decide to get a scratch card. Make today a Wednesday. Maybe a million pound Wednesday. With a new scratch card from the National Lottery. Your numbers make amazing happen. Search Dream Big, Play Small. Rules and procedures apply. Players must be 18 or over. The reason why this is pertinent for anyone who, who, who's not clear is because of the sort of um, U-turn you've undertaken yourself in, 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 in recent years. Again, I keep, I keep suggesting we're not going to get there just yet, but, but we will get there imminently. I, just, I, just, I thought you might say cricket, Peter, when I asked you if you'd ever found your tribe. And, and cricket, in, in a way, because I know that you've played cricket in some of the parts of the world that you've just described, I, 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 I was sad to hear that you didn't feel were you happier at cambridge than you were at school i mean did you begin to sort of find a sense of purpose or a sense of belonging no i shall tell you when i started to feel more a bit more relaxed about life yeah when i became a journalist right thanks to this person i'd known at school 
Yeah. I had no training, and uh, it was a mid. And I got into, and I remember I got did my, I, I got a job. I got a job, and I remember the first day there, sitting down and typing out a story, and just knowing I'd come home. It was a quite extraordinary. Well, that's that's what I, that's what I was pushing you for. That's what I wanted to yeah. find out, and 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 that makes it all the more powerful, of course, that you. In a sense, um, uh, it did what an awful lot of journalists perhaps have wanted to do at various times in the last 10 years, as, as everything sort of got worse in some ways. And, and you, 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 you walked away from plum jobs and you walked away from um, columns and positions that, that, that many people still in the business would dream of having. So let, let, let's, well, very briefly, just talk me through your rise up the ladder from, from Robert, Robert Maxwell's magazine to... Um, to, to, to one of the most recognisable bylines in the country, and, and you're not allowed to be a, a modest. Just give me, give me the. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> yes, I, I, uh, I uh, yeah, I, I then got a job on the Evening Standard. And I was hired by Max Hastings uh, at the Telegraph, which I couldn't work for him. So I went back on the scrap heap. Actually, I had to crawl back to the Evening Standard, and then I was on the City Pages, which was great fun. I was, uh, yeah, I was, uh, and then. Paul Dacre. <laughs> I was summoned to the editor's office and told to become a political journalist. Why? What did so he did. see that you hadn't even? What did he see that you hadn't even seen yourself? It's very interesting. It was very. I don't know really. He never told me, and I asked him. <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Why?" I tell you, I, there was a. There was one. I mean, I, I, you probably. I think I know where you would stand on Paul Dacre. But um, he, so I was, I learned more. He sent me, he, in about 1992, he sent me to, I was dispatched to Frankfurt, which was then angling to become the next, to head the European Central Bank, as indeed it did, and do a job on it. So I went to Frankfurt. It was, it was a 2,000 word hatchet job on Frankfurt. That was basically the instruction. <laughs> I, I earnestly went to Frankfurt, sort of interviewed a banker or a sort of analyst or two and a restaurant owner or something. After 10 hours, I'd been given a week. I was, a whole, I was ordered back to London to write it. So I dutifully, after 10 hours in Frankfurt, got, <laughs> following morning, I went to my desk and wrote 2,000 words. <laughs> and and uh, then I got the message to the editor secretary, this is rubbish. Come into the office. Oh, it was a most terrifying moment. I never met this man. I come into the office. So I got on the tube because the city office was in the city to Kens, wherever it was. I think Kensington. And said, said this is balls. And I, he, in those days, you had this enormous uh, readout. And interestingly, I, I saw what he'd done with it. He had that actually, ch he changed about 50 words. He'd given it a slightly different intro. And a few adjectives, and he and I, <laughs> I said, "Go and go and put that, put that." And I really almost no change. It took me about fifteen minutes maximum, maybe ten minutes, just to make these changes. And it had turned to being of a really solid piece of work to a brilliant piece of work, absolutely amazing, with real pace and energy. And uh, so I did that, represented. He said, and he he said, he said, "All right, Oborn, you're a pretty boy. You can have a picture byline." And that was our <laughs> first meeting with Mr. Dake. And I, learned, I did learn a lot from that. I learned how to give pace to tabloid stories. And, and that, I mean, in a way, your, your, your trajectory was pretty much uninterrupted after that. Yeah, we had uh, four year, marvellous years, actually. I was very lucky to work for one of the nicest, best men in the business. Charles Rice was the political editor of the Evening Standard. Yes. Um, and he was incredibly kind. And then I was hired by the uh, Sue Douglas. Do you remember the Sue Douglas yes. moment? At the, uh, in fact, the, I think you do remember it. Yes, that's right. And uh, I went there for a fight with like Sunday Express with, with the man of the moment, Simon Walters. Um, yes. And uh, we went to get, and then I, then I was headhunted. Well, no, then what happened was that, remember, Dirty Dez turned up. The, uh, I'd already office. just left. I'd, I'd just moved on by then, but yeah, of course I remember. There were but you, the principal people like you were uh, left because the, I took the view that he was no worse or better than any other proprietors. Yes, and uh, but then I realised I get an enormous payoff 
because he set in motion a voluntary redundancy scheme. And I was tipped off that something to do with my contract. I was, so I, I got voluntary redundancy. And the day after, <laughs> Boris Johnson rang me up and said, do you want to be a political correspondent of a spectator? So there we are. Um, and this is, this is, I mean, the perfect point at which to start examining your, well, what, how do you describe it? So I'm going to read you a line. I'm sure you're sick to death of, of hearing it. I'm struck by how recent it was um, when the referendum got underway. I think we last bumped into each other in budgeons and you were still of this view. And, and I, I wanted to hit you over the head with a baguette. But this was your view. <laughs> At the time, in my opinion, Michael Gove and Boris Johnson are the two most brilliant politicians of their generation. Courageous men with the personal charisma and intellectual gifts to ensure that the case for Britain to leave the EU is seriously heard. Anyone who is a patriotic Briton and everyone who believes in democracy should welcome. I don't want to relitigate Brexit. I do that. Um, I do that every day on the radio. But I do want to examine how you go from that in the space of five years to, to the assault on truth, your latest book which i mean essentially lays responsibility for this utter clues in the title it lays much of the responsibility for the denigration of truth at the feet of one of the men you're describing there as, as um well close to messianic status what what happened I think you're uh, you're misreading me there i I, th I stand by every word i wrote i mean i oh, okay i i uh, i was saying they're brilliant politicians and um and they were. So there's no moral judgment. There's no moral judgment in that paragraph I just read. You're, you're describing intellectual gifts, charisma, courage, not integrity, not honesty, and not reverence for truth. That's your point. Well, uh, yeah, I think, and also I think my judgment uh, about their brilliance was vindicated. I mean, they did transform politics in a way nobody has. I also think it was fair dues to have a big argument about it. I mean, I, I hadn't agitated for a referendum, but mm -hmm. if you believe that politics is about the clash of ideas, um, uh, the, um, uh, you know, that's, that's, a, that's um, fair dues. And they were, they did. If you, are you, what, I think the background to that, I wrote, I'd written a piece in uh, the British Journalism Review. If you remember what political discourse was like under Blair, you really couldn't say anything about anything at all. It was all controlled and there was some thought police out there, you know, Alistair Campbell on, you know, you said something. But the two sort of most exciting politicians of the time were Byers and Milburn. I mean, for heaven's sake, you know, they wouldn't say anything. So, but, and so I think, so, and, the, and then the, the Tories under Cameron and Osborne mimicked that. They thought that was the way to success and they, and they hired a, their own thug in the shape of Coulson, the News of the World former editor, to uh, police political discourse. And Johnson and Gove, we can agree about a lot of things now, but they were, they did challenge that, that hegemony of dullness. Now it may be, and I'm reflecting about this, that there's more to be said for dullness than I've realized. I didn't get vaccinated. I did get really ill. I did three days in bed and then about a week on the sofa. I didn't taste a thing for about a month. I still don't do stairs if I can help it. I didn't think it would be this bad. If you're unvaccinated, you're much more likely to be hospitalised with COVID-19 than if you've had both doses of the vaccine and the booster. Get vaccinated now at nhs.uk slash COVID vaccination. This is where I, I, I slightly lose the thread here because when you detail in the new book the kind of catalogue of calumnies that they were responsible for during the referendum i and this was the last conversation we had over the baked beans i, I felt that the project was undermined from the start by the character of the key players i, I would have reached originally for farage but johnson you knew better than anybody that Johnson can't lie straight in bed, and yet here you were still, still. Yeah, but I didn't think. Um, by the way, I, I, the the yes campaign had plenty of lies. And there's a, there's um, a difference between a prediction no, that doesn't come true and something that was untrue on the day that you said it. 
Yeah, no, no, no. The yes camp, yes, but that's also true. Of my, I mean, most of it was predictions about the future from both sides. And the, the yes campaign made a load of statements which didn't come true. No, I, I, I said I didn't Osborne, want to read. I'd already Brexit. concluded that Osborne yes. was one of the most duplicitous politicians I'd come across. And, uh, you know, you, you, you know we, we are now very familiar with all the dodgy hedge fund managers and so forth, but there were oh. some very unsavoury people associated with the yes cat. I'm not going to need name them, but I, for no, legal no, no. reasons. What? <laughs> and so, um, I mean, it's, I, 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 by the way, you're right. I have thought about this and I'm, uh, but that is what I, if you looked at it at the time. Yeah. Um, I know I, I didn't hail Mr. Johnson and go as you kindly recognize as pillions, pillars of integrity. I just said that they were, they brought a spark to politics, but I was not, I, where I was very, um, where I was guilty of, and I have acknowledged it, I think in a television, sorry, in a radio conversation with you before, I was wrong. Mm -hmm. And I, I eat myself about it because the consequence of getting wrong was to uh, enable Britain to be taken over by the uh, vote leave mob. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, admitting that you're wrong is rare in, in modern life, let alone modern media and, and modern politics. But I, I still haven't quite joined the dots because you, you're, you're dissatisfied. Right. There's two problems I've got. The first is that you, your thesis is really, really powerful in the book. And yet, for me, it's almost undermined a bit by the, you mentioned buyers, I think, it was buyers not getting sat by Tony Blair that formed the, the, the foundation of a book that you wrote right back then, mm. that, 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 that growth of political life. We, we may disagree about this, but I, I don't quite understand. For me, Trump and Johnson represent a departure. They represent something horribly new. And yet, sometimes when I listen to you and read you, and today particularly, you, you, you seem to subscribe to the they're almost all as bad as each other school of thought. No, absolutely not. not. Right. I don't, no, no, I completely, look, I, when I was assessing Johnson in 2016, um, I'd known him, I, have to, I, I, I really enjoyed working for him. I find him a really interesting and cool. colleague. He'd always been, as far as I was concerned, he'd actually been quite loyal and... Yes. Um, I had a couple of scrapes, I don't know if you remember Black Rod and so on. Um, and he'd always really stood yeah. by me. And uh, I'd always had very, I thought he had the most gifted, brilliant mind in politics I'd ever encountered. And I, th I, and I didn't think, I thought, um, I, I mean, I wasn't, and I wasn't aware, as I, you can criticize me for this, but I hadn't sort of investigated his background particularly. You know, sure. Um, uh, and I, and uh, at that stage, and I, 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 I had no particular reason to feel that he was honest, but I didn't feel that like, what has happened since he became prime minister is quite extraordinary. Since quite he became extraordinary. prime minister, not, not, not since, since he sort of set his sights on Theresa May, but yeah. Uh, and by the uh, way, and your I, book. If you, if you, if you go back and check what I wrote. I supported May's deal right up to the end. And you went I, through, you I went through my cuts because people have had a go at me. And I was brutal to Boris Johnson. Yeah, I was yes. brutal to Johnson about the way he destroyed her deal. I was also was there a moment? about the way he, he failed as foreign secretary to do anything, uh, to, conf to uh, confront the Saudi, Saudi barbarity in the Yemen. And I think I was the only journalist to do that in the lobby. Uh, you know, the fact that we, he didn't, he protected the Saudis from war crimes investigations. And um, I was also brutal to him about sanctioning as Britain's British plan holder in Myanmar about, you know, he was foreign secretary during the Myanmar genocide of the Rohingya when he actually supported, Britain supported, the genocidal regime which was carrying out. I, w I was, you know, I mean, I, I was pretty, I think in many ways, I was the only 
uh, political journalist, and I can't know of any foreign correspondents who did it, who really went really majored on the Yemen, where Britain was party as penholder in the United Nations to bringing about the worst humanitarian crisis of the 21st century, and party to a genocide under his on his watch, uh, and and uh, I suppose making um, I mean it's less epochal, but for the family it would be at least as important, wading into the Nazanin Sagari Ratcliffe situation and making it worse than it already was. I mean, that, that again is, is yeah. I just thought, evidence of character that was there before. So it's roughly spring 2019 that your, your sort of turn, and, 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 and again, bravely, you did it in print, you did it, you did it on paper. And, and, and I just... It was, turn on, it, it, I turned on Brexit, but I just... Not just Brexit, I mean, but Johnson. They're inseparable, value. aren't they? What? They're no, inseparable. I don't think now. so. Now, anyway, on, on, the point I'm making to you yeah. is that on Johnson, I was savage to him on Brexit from the moment he started going against May's deal. And, um, and I was savage to him, as nobody else was, about Yemen. And, and, uh, and I know, the, you know the, the British political press is totally myopic but Yemen is one of the great crimes I actually took the trouble to go there it's yes. very difficult to do one of the great crimes and a huge shame on Britain I mean terrible and the Rohingya where we didn't stand up against a genocide it's quite amazing I mean it's awful and so I, I I've noticed I've been good at, I, I was always perfectly frank about Johnson and that's one of the, and I cited this when, when I was, uh, I was still at the, when Johnson started to run for the leadership, I, I didn't back him. I, I took some doing at the mail. Uh, I said I wrapped Rory Stewart and I explained why I didn't, because uh, um, uh, I didn't think that I cited Johnson's, which I'd really gone at, you know, his failure on those two great issues, terrible issues. Yes. And then, uh, and then I supported Jeremy Hunt. I never went for supporting Johnson in the leadership. No, it was part no, of the base. Yeah, I do. I do know that. I do understand that. I'm not. I'm not trying to portray you as some sort of cheerleader for him through through, through throughout the years. But I am. I, I'll tell you what. I'll level with you. I, I find it a little bit hard to understand, and I think I'm coming closer to understanding it. As someone as clever as you, and someone as plugged in as you, can be surprised by what's happened since he's got into Downing Street. And 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 I know you're surprised. You're disgusted. And show it of a new moral barbarism. I would argue that the evidence of Johnson's moral barbarism has been in place since his since his name appeared in, in, in public. But I think it may be because you're supremely uninterested in um, anything that's not the actual politics of it. You're not, I presume, interested in personal lives. Or you mentioned you couldn't work for Max Hastings. You'll be familiar with what Max Hastings. Well, are you familiar with what Max Hastings has said about Johnson subsequently? Or yeah, I was. I, I read it, but I didn't try yeah. to take Max seriously because I'd seen his. Because I didn't think, uh, but you know, loads of people can dis. I thought it was partly envy, actually, but he was right, by yes. the way. And um, I, I left two jobs because of Max Hastings. I also left the Evening Standard job because of Hastings. When he turned up, I couldn't work for him. And uh, I, find that was a, I had a very interesting thing of fourth rate, first class, fourth rate mind, Max. Uh, <laughs> uh, he sacked my dad, so you're not going to get any defence. Your dad of him one of the greatest journalists of the 20th century, by the way. He's um, our James O'Brien, eh? Yeah. 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 I mean, but he would. Fashioned reporter. It, well, and he would agree with every single syllable of your latest. I'd, so th th there are. Just a two, couple more things I want to nail down. That thing of you being surprised. How, how could you have been surprised by what he turned out to be when he got into Downing Street? And I'll I tell you, fully I followed Johnson. Look, at the Spectator, he wasn't there very much. Sure. Yeah? He left it to a very capable deputy, um, Stuart Reid, who was the, yeah. basically, uh, and uh, other people. Uh, he produced a really good mag. Now, I missed that is. Then he was mayor of London. Same story. He was very good at choosing deputies and choosing capable. This is what I, this is how I thought he'd run the country, but uh, choosing capable deputies and um, and actually adding a bit of spice and fun 
that's how he was mayor of London for eight years, which I thought he'd made a, a success of. And so I thought he'd be prime minister along that model. And if you, I uh, didn't support him because I, for the reasons sure. I've explained, but when he became prime, the, the hiring of Cummings um, was just a poor, I couldn't believe it actually. And then uh, he started lying at, at the leadership, con the Tory leadership contest. I was, I was shocked by the way right. he conducted himself. And, he, um, and uh, that's why, and then, uh, uh, but then I, then he's, then once, and I wanted very shortly after he became leader, like a few weeks, he installed um, Dominic Cummings and this creature, Lee Kane in uh, Downing Street. And they started, I don't know who, we di who did it, but Tory sources used to put out smears. And mm. I really thought that was repulsive. And I said, then, I, then I started. You hold journalists who are complicit in that. In, they were. In, in I, its... I wrote a piece. I tried to get it published in various papers, or two papers, anywhere I could, and I couldn't get a paper to do it. And that's when I wrote a piece for um, Open Democracy. Yes. That was the end of my... And since then, I've written about two pieces for mainstream papers. Because you named names, Peter, you, you called out, I mean, pretty much everybody, actually. I mean, most obviously, I suppose, Laura Kunzberg and, and Robert Peston, but you haven't pulled, I've seen your exchanges with Amol Rajan and, and this idea that, I mean, to justify it to someone who doesn't follow journalism, it, it's simply about access. If, if we were to do what Peter Oborn has done, we'd never get our calls returned again by the contacts and the sources that we need to be getting copy on the telly or in the paper every day. Right? That's what they'd say. Yeah. That's what they, it's dreadful, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it is dreadful, but it's also true. Yeah, they, they shouldn't go along with that. You're being black, you're, they're using accent. It was, t it was um, that very overrated American, uh, British American journalist. She's invented this. It was called, uh, at, she was a very successful edi editor of a magazine in the States. And basically, you give celebrities control of that copy in return for access you better not name her she'll sue let's start again that that, that what it was invented in the <laughs> she will so, i don't think she'll say it's just copy approval and and when you started out that was unheard of when i became showbiz editor of the express when you were still on the sunday copy approval was almost becoming commonplace yeah and this and so then mandelson was starting to practice that in uh, in fleet street at the time yes. it was a feature of new labor that they would sort of almost have an official list of approved journalists. And then, but this was, dip, this, what Johnson did, which really shattered me, was take it into a new, right. into a new uh, zone where they would fabricate lies and smears, give those to journalists who would just run them as Tory sources said. I mean, the worst is one, which I thought, I mean, it just turned my stomach. It was a Mail on Sunday splash at the height of the height of the sort of the Brexit, the the Remainer, the so-called Remainer about you know when it, Parliament was going into stasis. Yes. It, was, it named talk, was it Dining Street sources actually. Dining Street sources said they were investigating links between foreign powers. Yes. And uh, so Oliver Letwin, Dominic Grieve, and Hilary Benn. Now, uh, there was, I, I investigated that. I said, "This is this obviously isn't." I, I rang up the, I rang up Dining Street. I said, "What? Where? Where is this investigation? Who's carrying?" It? And the, diff, the fascinating thing was, when I spoke to officials, they said, "No, there is no investigation." Then I rang up the political editor of the Mail on Sunday. He said, "There was. I, I've got two sources." And it's obvious what happened. I mean, then they they rang up the political spat, the special advisors who were briefing total fabrications for Mail on Sunday in order to smear the, these very honourable, three one of the most honourable politicians Britain has had in the last 30 years. Yes, I do. And I, it repelled me that. And it was going on, it, it was following up in the Sun and in the Express and the Times, that story. Johnson himself sort of stood it up when he was interviewed by Nick Robinson on the following Tuesday. And I thought that, that it just turned my stomach there. And, and I think this is, close to an answer to, to, the, to the next question I'm going to ask you. If you were to explain to somebody who is, 
not 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 massively engaged in the cut and thrust of Westminster or, or indeed the relationship between politics and media. How, how do you typify, and, and we haven't really brought Trump into it, so let's bring Trump into it a bit now. W what is it about what's happening now that is so at odds with all of the other dishonesties and dis deceptions and disingenuousness that you've um, railed against in the past? So, you know, what, what is it about this particular administration at this particular time that is in your view so much worse the book provides i mean evidence galore but just in 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 a, in a sentence or three what what is it that's so bad about what's going on now compared to all the bad stuff that has gone on previously i think in the day when your dad who i honor by the way i remember paul johnson writing about your father saying this is what journalism is about I don't even remember that piece by Paul Johnson. Yeah. And um, the, you, you wrote the truth. He, your father is a classic example of this, of somebody who wrote, he wasn't on anybody's side. He wrote the truth. He was indefatigable reporter. And now, the new generation of particularly political journalists, who are simply really gossip columnists being fed stuff from central office, it's pathetic, actually. And the Tory friends are around, people around Johnson. They sort of there they are, uh, running sort of soft stories. They don't even understand journalism. I want, allow me to say something very, which 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 I've, I've realised, is completely destroys the public domain. There's no common agreed area now where people can say this was true, this isn't true, this is a fact, this isn't a fact. It's just what side you're on. You know whether you're support the you know Manchester United or. Uh, Rangers or Celtic, you know, and and that the old tradition of proper journalism, and that is what's changed this week or this week. I'll tell you what's changed. It's very, uh, I, you probably noticed this that there's been a you noticed the Downing Street flat story, and the mail ran on it, ran, ran on it, and run on it, and run on it. Yeah, but, and there's been a huge amount of you know. These new generation of journalists, you know, the ones who become bloggers and columnists at the age of 25, they don't know what the story was, if it slapped them on the face, there they are. And I say, oh, well, why is it the mail's changed or changed yeah. editorial policy? Lord Rothermere's decided, or, that, you know, the 90 get Johnson out. We were well, trying to put Gove in. And there's an inheritor of your father's magnificent tradition, Simon Wolfs. At a, at a, he was our colleague at the say, Sunday Express. Yeah. At the Mail, he's been doing what is known as journalism, which the new generation of journalists don't even know what it is, because journalism involves taking a call from some bloody spad in Downing Street and sticking out a smear on someone they don't like, yeah? Something yeah. they need to destroy. Or some soft story to sort of soft soap the Prime Minister's image. Simon has been working away at that story, because you can see, for three or four months now. Yes, yes. None of them have followed him up. Very few, so I tell you, one or two, I've noticed, just almost nobody followed any of those stories up. They were absolutely, it was almost like dropping pebbles, pebbles into a well which had never bottomed, you know. And it went on and on for several months. Brilliant reporting, <laughs> revealing the details. And there was a whole load of kickback saying he's being misogynistic, going after... Yeah. Prime Minister's fiance and all of that, and um, it was being dismissed. And suddenly, it's and it was also uh, suddenly it's hit. You know, it's gone, got got gone ballistic, and it's now in PMQs. It's an electoral commission investigation. They can't ignore it. And that was about journalism, investigative journalism, political of the highest calibre. And uh, by the way, five huge credit. To Geordie Gregg. Yes, he for running with gave it. Gave the space and resources yeah. for a proper investigation. And he's uh, and G Geordie Gregg has, 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 has made, you know, he's made himself as editor of the mail this week. So he, he sanctioned that. He sanctioned that serious reporting with no fearless reporting, where if you make a single mistake, you're dead. And the mail, he's turned it into his mail as a rather, you know, his own mail now, which is but which will that... take on the establishment. It's a glorious 
what we've had this week with the with that story is the return of journalism the blood on the carpet may be all the credit that he needs we got boosted for the team chris pass the ball i'm on, I'm on. we got boosted to get together how have you been you've been all right oh, gosh i haven't seen you guys i got boosted because i don't want to get really ill we got boosted join us let's get protected over time, two doses do not give you enough protection against COVID-19. Get boosted now at nhs.uk slash COVID vaccination. So finally, I, I mean, the book is exhaustive in its chronicling of how far we've fallen. America seems to have climbed back quite quickly in the first 100 days of Joe Biden. Just, just give me a, a couple of, um, and, and I won't hold you to them or expect you to put any money on them. Just give me a couple of predictions about British politics in the next two years. I think that I think it's very hard for Johnson to stay. Right. Because you can't go on telling lies. You see, because the, they actually, the, it's been tolerated so far because the press just made a collective decision to allow him to tell whatever lie he liked. But then, it, you know, he says, there's, but these, there's actually a real, there is a real world out there. It's not all postmodernism. Mm. And, you know, so he says there's no going to be no tra bre bre there's no trade, trade barriers in Northern Ireland. Well, there is, and, that, and then real things start to happen, tragic things. Right. The past yeah. comes at you. And, um, you say there's going to be no, you know, there's no problems with the single market, and then little businesses are going out of business, going out of And I, I, and I think that I, but I may be too optimistic. We have to work at it now because something's gone horribly wrong. We have to uh, challenge this culture of deceit and this moral cesspit, which which is Johnson's Dining Street. But I think that there will be a moment when he will be caught up in something so dishonest and unethical what well, he already has that the rule this this funny rule which we've made for him that he can do what he likes he'll be hauled back into the the, the, the reality that the rest of us have to recognize at some point mm. um the assault on truth by peter oborn has you will not be surprised to hear not been widely reviewed in any of the newspapers that he used to work for i hope this podcast has given you an indication as to why that may be and hopefully encouraged you to to pop out and buy it now peter it's been an absolute pleasure